Hello everybody, I've got a video today that I've been wanting to do for about a month, two months, and that is visiting this system here. So, I previously had another YouTube channel with quite a lot of videos on it already, and I decided to make this new one to kind of improve the videos I do, and just sort of cast aside, that one had a lot of random videos on, and I just wanted to kind of have a bit of a fresh start. So, about a year ago, I got hold of this and it worked fine. I did a quick video on it that I wasn't overly happy with. Um, there were a few things I wanted to do or I can see I wanted to do better. So I thought, what better time to revisit it than now with me having a new channel. Unfortunately, this thing decided to stop working about a month and a month and a half ago. So I've had it sent off for repairs and it came back and it's absolutely fine. And just on a side note, um, for anyone with retro systems in the UK, um, Amigas, all of such like. There was a guy um, goes used to go by the name of Amiga Passion, now goes by Retro Passion. He's the one who had a look at my Amiga. Absolutely fantastic work, super friendly, really knows his stuff. Um, would highly recommend. So I just wanted to get that out of the way now. So now that I've got this back, I wanted to just have a quick look at it. So first of all, just a little bit of history about this machine here. As you can see, it's the Amiga, it's an A600, and we've got the company there, Commodore. So the very, very first Amiga was the Amiga 1000, released in 1985. And that was more of a traditional big box home computer. So you had all your components, you'd plug your keyboard in, you'd plug your mouse in, or other peripherals. They also released this sort of machine, which was a small, I guess what you, a small version, but it's more of an all-in-one type machine. The first one was the Amiga 500, then I think it was the Amiga 500 Plus, which was the machine that I owned. This one is quite an interesting one. This one came out around the same time that Commodore were pushing the Amiga 1200. The 1200 was quite a step up technologically from what had come before. It had, um, it, it ran via an AGA chipset, chipset, which, you know, was more advanced, could play different things, it had more power in it. The 600 was meant to be a sort of budget version of of an Amiga at the time. I think it was released about 1991-92. There were a few problems with this when you look into the history of it. For one, you might notice the lack of a numpad, which for certain flight games caused quite a few issues. The other thing was, at this point, most people probably had 500s, 500 pluses. There was no real need for this, so it didn't actually do that well. In more recent years, it has become quite desirable by collectors, and I think that's probably maybe because you can expand it some more. Um, it's probably a little bit more durable. So we'll just have a quick look at it. So as you can see there, we've got you know, your front thing there, you've got your keyboard. So this is quite interesting to start with. This isn't actually just a stock Amiga 600. The first thing of note is we have what's called a Gore-Tec drive-in. The original Amigas ran all of their games and such via a floppy disk. This one has swapped it out for a USB port. And I'll probably show it off in a bit, but what will happen is you plug in your USB stick, you select your games by these two little triggers here and it displays which one you've selected there so let's have a look on the back of it as well what parts you get you get a lot of really really old style parts so that's for your power an rf modular for the cables going to your tv we've got the yellow the red and white for audio we've got a video part there a parallel port, serial port, and for a disk drive here. So, just a bit more on the actual Amiga itself. When it was released, um, it was, by all accounts, quite advanced for when it was released. The 1000s, at least. The 500 was a very, very popular home computer. Unfortunately, there were a number of bad business decisions made by Commodore in terms of what they released, when they released them. Things like the CDTV, things like this A600, just hit them. Um, and I'm sure there was loads of articles and other videos out there that can explain it a lot better than me. Uh, this was released, like I said, early 90s. By 1994, Commodore were pretty much about to go out of business. Their last gasp was basically to release what they called the 
Amiga CD32, which was a pure home gaming console. These things were always known for playing games, but for doing so much beyond. They could do great things with music at the time. They could do great things with um, 3D modelling at the time. You know, they were used in some earlier, early 90s um, TV shows. And... Like I said, the last ditch by Commodore was really the CD32, which was a pure home console. It was just an Amiga 1200 in a console, sold for about four to five hundred pounds. Came with a controller that didn't look great. I'll show a picture of it. Um, but much like the A600, the CD32 has in recent years became a bit more of a collector's item, something a bit more desirable. And that is because people had such a love for the Amiga they continue to develop parts for it after Commodore died, after the Amiga was seen to die. You can get expansions for it, which this um, does actually have an expansion in there. It's just got an extra couple of megabytes of memory. So this thing has about two or three megabytes of memory in there, which is a stark contrast to the computers of today. So let's take a look at this powering on and have a look at a couple of games. As you can see, it's now powered on, and we've got the nice little loading disc screen on there. This is a very familiar purple screen to me um, as a child. So, let's um, actually load up a game, shall we? So, what I've got here is a USB stick that I'll plug into my GoTech, and I can select a game. So, let me just show you how to do that. So, what we'll do, we'll load up quite a simple game to start with. So, you can see that there, and it's... Uh, Obviously came on on here, so I'm flipping through all the games, you've got Shadow of the Beast, um, Supercars, Super Frog, Turrican, um, but we've already gone past the one that I wanted to select, which is always a good test case, but we will select the original Pinball Dreams to begin with. So as you can see, that is, that has been selected, and the game is now loading. We see there the digital digital illusion screen. So one of the things that I do really like about um, going back and seeing a lot of these old games is seeing how companies have evolved. This is a pinball game uh, by a company called Digital Illusions back in the day, which would later go on to become Dice, who would go on to create Battlefield. Um, and I love seeing that evolution. There's another game I've got on here, Lost Vikings, made by I can't remember the original company name, but they would go on to become Blizzard. So that's just like really cool for me to see that evolution of companies. And I love seeing the imagery for the logos there. Sometimes the logos are a bit quite simple nowadays, but these ones you had like the Psygnosis like, logo it looked incredible, that 21st century entertainment one looked great. Um, this particular game here, I think this might have been one of the very first games I ever played on the Amiga actually. I do always remember going around to a uh, family friend's place when I lived in Turkey and he had the Amiga 500 Plus that I would like to go on to get. I would go on to own. My dad bought it off of him. And this was one of the first games I played along with uh, Lotus 2 and Zool. So now we have to select disc 2 because, like I say, these games run on floppy disks. So we just go up one. Uh, Pinball Dreams, disc 2 of 2. And we wait for it to load. Which, there we go. Pretty quick. So now we have a choice of four tables there. We can go for, um, let's just go for Ignition to start off with. And that bar that is loading. Um, let's continue. Um, so yeah, this is one of the first games I've played along with uh, Lotus 3, Zool and Super Frog, which hopefully I'll get a chance to show you all of them as this goes on. So we'll just move the cable out of the way. And hopefully it won't take too long to load. Of course, this is very old hardware, so the loading times will not be. So there we go, we got Pinball Dreams, the ignition table. Press F1. And the game starts. So I don't 
saw how good I would be at this. But yeah, so I was keen to show a little bit of gameplay footage of one of the ones that I did have as a kid. And this is one of the ones, um, there's always a thing with retro games, you know, whether or not they still hold up today. Obviously, this is a pinball game, so I think it had a quite good chance of holding up today. My abilities at it, not so much. So, let's go take a look at a couple of more, a couple more games. So, the next game we're looking at is a game called Super Frog. Now, this was a favourite of mine back in the day, and it's one that I can actually still play nowadays. And I think it's aged fairly well. It sort of sits for me alongside you know, the classic Sonic and Mario games as games that have aged fairly, fairly well. So this was by Team 17 back in the day, famous nowadays for worms. The premise here is that you play as a prince who was turned into a frog by an evil witch after the princess was kidnapped. You gained magical powers through drinking Lucasade. And the game itself is fairly simple, it's uh, you know, a cutesy 2D platformer. Um, you can see there, you just control them around. It's very bright, very colourful, and it's air drop really, really well. You get no power-ups in it, so you've got this little ball thing which you can hit enemies out the sky. And I've also got some wings where if I tap the appropriate button on the controller, he just floats in place. So I can come across here, come down here. So we'll just walk through one level of this. The idea is you collect the number of coins on the bottom right um, to unlock the exits to the level. The levels are a little bit somewhat non-linear in as it gets on. You'll have like key cards to collect to get through certain areas. It can be, as time goes on, it can be quite a difficult game as well, as a lot of these old games could be. But like I say, in, when you compare it to other games of the time, this one's aged fairly well. The soundtrack to this one was done by a guy called Alistair Brimble, and it's a lovely soundtrack. Um, he also, I believe, did Alien Breed, which is another fantastic. Team 17 game from this era, which actually did see another outing on the Xbox 360 a couple of years ago, as did Super Frog. It got a HD version, which I remember wasn't really too well received, but it was something that I quite enjoyed. So as you can see there, now I have enough points to get the exit. I just picked up my Lucasade there. Uh, the speed items, and my Dark Sky. Like that. And then I'm through. So what you could do at the end of levels is you could collect all your points or you could go through and gamble. So let's gamble and have a look. So when you gambled, your sort of main prize here was a level code to get you to the corporate places because there were no save games here. So I've got 8 credits and it's just a matter of hitting that collect. If I get 3 Lucas Aids in a row, I get the level code. I can hold that. I can hold that. So let's see if I get my third Lucasade tin, and I do, and that gives me the level code, which I actually do believe somewhere written down, I already have that level code, so I won't make a note of that, but there you have it, that's just a brief glimpse of Super Frog. So the very next game I wanted to show off was this one, Lotus 3. This was another one of the first games that I ever played. Um, I've got very fond memories of, of playing this one. Um, so obviously this is the third one in the Lotus series. Um, I had Lotus 2 and 3 on the Amiga. One of the big things with this one that um, is quite good is you could actually create your own courses here. And what that would do is allow you to set certain things like gradients, the environment, um, how many turns was in it. And it would output you a code that you could put here. And I suppose share them with your friends. Not that I had many friends that had Amigas back in the day. Um, so we'll just get on with quick play with that. So I'll set my gears to be automatic, I guess, and we'll just start up a race. So one of the big things in this is the music is absolutely fantastic. A lot of Amiga games have such good music. And um, you probably heard that in Super Frog and Pinball Dreams, and this is no exception. 
and there are some games here that I might not get around to showing, but I would definitely like to show off in streams or maybe other videos. Games like Turrican that just had such a good soundtrack that is listenable today. Games like uh, Cannon Ford had a very good soundtrack. Games like, um, like the, the sequel of Pinball Dream, Pinball Fantasies, and there are also various themes here and there. So we've got a choice of, let's go through, we've got a choice of a few cars here. Three cars, really. And then it comes through. Again, very slow kind of loan speeds there. If we get to pick a song, we won't pick anything for the soundtrack because it'll just drown me out, I guess. And the game itself loads. We have. Uh, you can write a sequence of time trials or you can go and try to come first a number of races uh, against a number of races. Sorry. There, you know, type of track it is. You can see kind of track it is. It had several themes for it, like you know, there was a forest theme, a hillside theme. This is like a future zone theme. Uh, it tells you how many races you've got there. So here we go. Well, there we go, and we start. So you can see it's kind of like that. I don't really know what you'd call this. It's, it's not 3D yet, but it's certainly mimicking it. That sort of early. Uh, 90s, late 80s kind of 3D for racing games. It's very, a game that's very, very easy to pick up and play. And the premise of this mode is that you've got a bunch of time trials you have to do, so it's getting to the checkpoint in the appropriate amount of time, avoiding all the other cars, and speeding around the map. It's not the most. You know, racing games are never really the most complicated things. Well, I guess when you get the most simulation based ones, they can be, but. It is the same premise generally, win. And that's it there, that's the first checkpoint. So there's only three laps to do. So they either come in laps or in sort of, you know, point to point, where it's split up into several sections. And obviously these do get harder as it goes on. Let's see, I haven't really got much in the way of obstacles, but the game can throw obstacles at you, you can throw rocks. Uh, little puddles, obviously other vehicles are a hindrance. Uh, if you play this game against other races, there is also a fueling mechanic. So as you do your race, you will lose fuel and you have to refuel at certain stations. Obviously that's not really a thing in the time trial mode. Obviously we've got other cars there. It, one, one of the things about this is it does have a really, really good sense of speed to it. Which, you know, is always one of the most important things with a racing game. Without that sense of speed, it can feel a little bit sterile. As you can see, this isn't uh, one of the most difficult of races. And we should be wrapping it up fairly shortly. There we have the level complete. So that's just a brief glimpse at Lotus 3. So I think we'll do one more game and then we can wrap this up. So the last game I wanted to show off in this video was this one, Lemmings. One that's probably familiar to quite a lot of people out there as this was released on pretty much every single platform going. Uh, Lemmings, if you don't know, is a very, is, is a incredible puzzle game. You control a well, you don't control them directly, you have a group of lemmings that will go from point A and just wander across the map um, in a forward direction. The idea is is to make use of various um, tasks you can give them to get them to the end point. It's incredibly simple but gets really complicated as it goes on. Um, so we'll just walk through it. You see they come out of this trapdoor here, my aim is to get them to here. And you have various means to do it, so you've got climbers. Um, floaters, exploders, blockers, builders, bashers, I can't remember what you call these ones, they're pickaxe blocks, and diggers. So, uh, miners, that's what you call these ones, miners. So, I just select the one I want, I don't have access to any others, this is just the first level. I select that, assign it to that one there, he starts digging through the map, and hopefully there we go, they all will go to the exit. 
It's like so. This one is an incredibly popular game, um, especially back in the day, selling you know, a huge amount of copies for that time. And it's been ported to pretty much every platform going from, uh, especially around that time. It was on the Amiga, it was on the Mega Drive, it was on the SNES, it was even on the Master System. It was on the um, whatever the Atari equivalent was at the time. It went to PC. It's been on um, various iterations. Been on the PlayStation. Um, when the PSP released. Because Sony now hold the rights to this game, you had a part of Lemmings for it. There's even a Lemmings mobile game out at the moment, which doesn't work quite the same as this, but it still has that spirit of Lemmings. Um, so I'll just play through a few levels and show this one off, because I just think this is always like a really fun one. Um, it's also one of the first ones I do tend to think of with the Amiga. So the idea is, is to get them into that one there. You use floaters for this, because if they fall, they will die. So I just click over them. As they go past, give them the floor ability. You see they open up the umbrella, and they're all out, and they're going towards the exit. So, one thing you might notice, you've got these plus and minus, that increases the rate at which they come out of the trap door, and I can do that as well. And what that does is it nukes them. Uh, say you get stuck in a level, or you run out of abilities, or you just don't care anymore, you can just set that off and nuke them all. Uh, this one makes use of your blockers, so you'll actually see the nuke one, nuke in uh, action here. So we wait for it to load. Like I said, these start off really, really simple. You know, you just need one thing for it. But as the levels go on, it can become brutally difficult. And you see the difficulty level of these is fun. So I set a blocker there. They run into him and they bounce off in the opposite direction. Set the blocker there, they bounce off, go in the opposite direction. Set one here, because I don't want him to fall off there, because I think they will not survive that fall. Got that there. Block. He comes along. And now they start to fall. So it's, it's a super charming, and then I'll show you the other mechanics. So if I do that there, it speeds them up coming off through the trap door. So I don't have to wait any longer for them to come out individually. I've got the path perfected, so nothing's going to go wrong with the rest of them. You can see they're all out now. You can see how many are out, the percentage that I've got in, how much time I've got left. And there we go. So the final batch are coming down now. It makes a really satisfying sound when you have this many in a row going into the exit. And there we go. And now I nuke the rest and you get to see them blow up. Five, four, three, two, one. And it's very satisfying to watch them blow up. So that's Lemmings. So we'll round this video off now. So just to round this off, a massive thank you to all of you who, you know, stopped to watch this. Hopefully, you know, you've enjoyed it. Please do feel free to leave comments. Please do like and subscribe and all that good stuff. Um, if any, if you did have an Amiga grown up and I have left off any of your favourite games on here, please let me know. I would love to stream or do a video of it in the future. I'm aware that there were so many games on the Amiga. I struggle to think of what I could actually showcase in this video. I know there's stuff like Turrican, Chaos Engine, Shadow of the Beast... There's all your point and clicks, Monkey Island, Monkey Island 2, Beneath the Steel Sky, Simon the Sorcerer. There's, you know, Lotus 2 and 3, there's um, Supercars, there's your two, there's Pinball Fantasy as a sequel to Pinball Dreams. There's another personal platforming favourite of mine, The Adams Family, on here. Um, my friend's personal favourite game, I'm sure he'll be very disappointed to watch this and see I haven't included Dalek Attack in there. But these are all games I would probably like to look at in the future or play in some capacity, either on a stream or maybe doing another video where I just go through a few games and show them off, um, show off how difficult they are. Um, like I said, thank you very much for stopping by to watch this. Hopefully you all enjoyed it and I'll see you again in a future video. Uh, just on a side note for stuff I am planning on doing, on the retro gaming front, I'm actually planning on buying an Amiga CD32, so I would like to show that off at some point in the future, when I do eventually get it. On the unboxing front, 
I have some Evangelion Nendoroids on their way, so I'm planning on doing a bit of an Evangelion Nendoroid special in the next week or so. That'll be all four of my Evangelion Nendoroids. So once again, thank you very much, and see you later.